Thank you so much for that uh, way too generous introduction. Uh, so, um, so appreciative, and, and thanks to Christoph Helmet, uh, Ariel Carmen, all of the staff, fellows, grad students who make the Carson Center such a special place. Uh, it is a real, real honor to be here, and I've just absolutely loved my time so far, and I've still got some months to go. So my goal here today might seem ambitious for a book, much less a talk, and a book that is still in its early stages, but my hope is to give you a sense of what I see as two of the defining trajectories of non-human animal life, and suggest why I think this might provide a compelling way to grasp something I'm calling the violent narrowing of life. I'll start this talk with a little context, what I think of as the great disjuncture between the magnitude and urgency of planetary crisis and the extent of unconsciousness and inaction, and then sketch out some elements of what I mean by the violent narrowing of life as a broad direction of socio-ecological change that comprises but is bigger than biodiversity loss. Next, in thinking about the crucial role that animals play and can ha or can have in affecting how people see the world unfolding around them, I'll argue that they tend to appear in overly narrow ways in influential environmental narratives and politics. And I'll then set out this conception of ghosts and things. What on earth is he talking about? Uh, as a way of uh, centering animals in the course of socio-ecological change, which I hope also suggests why interspecies relations matter so much in struggles for a more sustainable and peaceable world. Few things illustrate the great, great disjuncture between crisis and consciousness be, uh, better than the sixth extinction spasm, which has been very well established for decades and yet which still barely registers politically, oops, sorry, uh, barely registers politically or popularly in spite of a recent flurry of media attention in the past few years. Assessments of extinction risk have long centered on habitat loss and fragmentation, especially in the tropics, compounded by other stresses such as invasive species. But today, all assessments of biodiversity loss now stress how dangerously interactive it is with climate change. Reduced biodiversity is a powerful positive feedback for climate change, diminishing the capacity for carbon sequestration, and even, low, even at lower end warming scenarios are bound to imperil many terrestrial plants and animals, while continuing acidification threatens microorganisms at the basis of all ocean trophic webs, so nothing short of all ocean life. As complacency prevails amidst mounting crises, many are straining to find strong enough language and images to render visible, to shake the unconscious, and to stir action. Now part of this unconsciousness stems from how hard it is to perceive big problems in the rhythms of everyday life and the blur of markets, where commodities appear as a dizzying array of choices, differentiated by innumerable brands, aesthetic variations, packaging, creative marketing practices, and many which have moved through opaque, long-distance circuits. How can we decipher the socio-ecological relations involved in a cup of coffee, a package of razors, a pair of sneakers, a bottle of shampoo, a car, a cell phone? Where did the biological and physical materials come from? What labor and energy went into these processes? What emissions and wastes ensued? The complexity of such questions amid so many choices can have a numbing effect, as Marx warned of with the concept of commodity fetishism, as markets train people to focus on facades while the edifice lays out of sight and mind. The pace of planetary urbanization amplifies this blur. The world is now over half urban and will reach 70% urban in just another generation. And a fast growing share of humanity is spending far less time outdoors in direct contact with soil and proximity to woods, fields and wetlands, and more waking hours in buildings, grinding daily commutes and buying things in ubiquitous places like supermarkets, shopping malls and fast food chains. The withering sense of bioregions that people inhabit contributes to shifting baseline syndrome, where incremental losses, especially spread out over a few generations, reduces the ability to sense loss and what is normal. Even amid soaring inequality, certain technologies and elements of technoculture are globalizing fast. Things like YouTube, Facebook, Hollywood movies, video games, pop music reach into slums and no longer so remote villages to an extent that would have seemed implausible not long ago. And the world buzzes with ever more tweets, GIFs, status updates, and boundless apps. Sensory deprivation of one sort is complicated by sensory overload of another, casting further shadows. 
To think about some of the most fundamental ways that life is narrowing, I get my bearings from the field of political ecology. And the bottom shot is from my work uh, in Jamaica, the mountains of Jamaica that Christoph noted, which at its most basic focuses attention on the political economic forces driving the nexus of ecological and social chains, change. A basic assumption is that processes like the destruction of forests, the degradation of soils, the toxification of environments, and worsening food security cannot be understood outside of inequalities in wealth and power that typically extend far beyond the local scale. More plainly, uh, environmental transformations are always wrapped up in unequal winners and losers, or as Blakey and Bro Brookfield famously put it, one person's degradation is another's accumulation. The pursuit of accumulation is the most elemental motive force in capitalism, and it is inextricably connected to the relentless pursuit of economies of scale, because substituting technology for labor can reduce costs in a decisive way. Or this means that once a significant labor saving technology takes hold in any sector, it becomes essential to competitive fitness. The factory floor is the archetypal site for thinking about economies of scale. As factories have long been central to how labor-saving technologies have, uh, are conceived in textbooks and, pop and, and popularly from the cotton mill to the Fordist assembly line to assembly line robotics and now to fast-moving worlds of artificial intelligence. Factories have mainly featured in political ecology in relation to environmental injustices surrounding siting and pollution. And Matt Huber has made a compelling case that political ecologists need to give more attention to the hidden abodes of factory production itself, which I think is especially apt with respect to the extremely hidden abodes of industrial animal production, as I will get to. The pursuit of scale is also continually transforming the production and extraction of biological and physical materials. Just think about how much work is replaced by a single tractor, a harvester combine, a feller buncher, or a bucket wheel excavator. But to fit large machinery, landscapes must be biologically simplified and standardized, remade into exchangeable parts, as Jason Moore puts it, remade into monoculture fields, tree plantations, drained wetlands, ocean and freshwater aquaculture zones, dams and irrigation networks, open pit mines. The clearest illustration of this from my work in agriculture, I think, is that just three animal species and ten crops, all with narrowing genetic profiles, dominate world agricultural production. But there are other abundant examples from fast-growing pine, eucalyptus, palm tree, plant, palm tree plantations to aquaculture enclosures filled with GM salmon or shrimp. The pursuit of scale further contributes to the narrowing of life through countless pollution loads from both point sources and expansive monocultures. The latter is rooted in the fact that while biological simplification and standardization confers certain economic advantages, it also po poses intractable biolo uh, biological and physical problems that are never resolved but are instead repeatedly overridden with external inputs, a tendency that is entwined with the proliferation of synthetic chemicals, or in Rachel Carson's great terms, a permanent war on nature. Some concentrated pollution loads produce almost uninhabitable spaces, as in the exclusion or sacrifice zones, and increasingly also in dead zones. This is the top one is close to my neck of the woods, uh, not so great Lake Erie. Dead zones were once, uh, once mainly a product of a natural accumulations of nitrogen and phosphorus, and now they're also a story uh, on a world scale of macroplastics. And macroplastics now register as a serious factor in declining global seabird populations. <laughs> the bioaccumulation of toxins that Carson warned of continues to abound in terrestrial and aquatic environments, perhaps nowhere more jarring than in the fact that some whale carcasses that wash ashore get handled as hazardous waste. Extreme accumulations of capital should also be understood, I suggest, as another core element of this narrowing of life, as real power over how the world is organized continues to consolidate around a small number of global titans. World trade pivots on a mere 500 corporations, which together control about 70% of world trade, and whether the top four firms dominate the world story in chemicals and seeds, or whether it's the top 11 in auto manufacturing, 
take any sector, uh, any, any major economic sector exhibits a similar picture of oligopoly, oligopolistic corporate control with the same essential thread, finance capital, increase, increasingly roven through it while being subsidized to varying degrees by states and industrial countries. This trajectory obviously ties to the polarization of individual wealth, which is so extreme that it is incredible to think it's still growing. And at the other end of the, the global spectrum of wealth, the World Bank's international poverty line not only reflects some economist determined subsistence level income now, $1.90 a day, um, below which sits about 800 million people, but it also speaks to the foreclosure of subsistence alternatives. In sum, to me, the violent narrowing of life is meant to describe intersections of ecological and human impoverishment bound together with globalizing economic compulsions and cultural reference, polarizing wealth and power, and standardizing productive environments. Violence also signals the infliction of harm and the need to set environmental problems in light of both amoral syst systemic compulsions and highly uneven agency within them. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Part of the challenge of the Great Disjuncture involves searching for creative ways to make planetary crises visible and comprehensible amid the complexities of everyday life, a challenge that Rachel Carson understood so brilliantly and lived so courageously. And one of the things that she showed with her warning of Silent Spring is that the trajectories of animal life can have a crucial role affecting how people see the world unfolding around them. And a basic premise of this project is that animals are both a crucial aspect of the violent narrowing of life and can have a key role in communicating it and to trigger thoughtful reflection about the socio-ecological relations of modern societies from positions of empathy and humility, or what Kat has been calling softness. I don't have time to get in all of the reasons for this here, other than to indicate I draw inspiration and many insights from ethology, strands of moral philosophy, and the burgeoning realm of critical animal studies. Most of all, the insistence that individual animal lives are worthy of moral consideration. Human societies cannot be understood outside of their relations to animals any more than they can be understood outside of their relations to nature. A Cartesian dualism, and that human societies increasingly bear on animal life everywhere, though in widely varying ways. While the effective power of animals might seem obvious and intuitive on one level, it is not at all straightforward. And it is important to recognize that the trajectories of animal life very often appear in a narrow profile within influential strands of environmentalism. And this can in turn serve to limit the remit of conservation, what counts and what doesn't. So influential strands of environmentalism have long been moved and strategized around endangered animals, in particular the big conservation organizations. And we can see this continuing emphasis on billboards all around Munich. This is a subway stop near my place. Here. Well, there are some older antecedents. Modern conservation is generally seen to have arisen in the 19th century in a desperate effort, desperate attempts, series of desperate attempts to protect endangered animals from extinction as populations crashed owing to habitat loss or wild killing sprees like the buffalo or both. For some early conservationists, rescuing large animals from the brink was a purely intrinsic ethical imperative, while other influential strands emerged out of blatant self-interest and big game hunters seeking to ensure the biggest trophies would be there into the future. In either case, whether as ethical imperative or a sport, the race against extinction was the bottom line for conservation. Initially, it was assumed that if conservation efforts could secure big enough spaces to maintain large, wide-ranging animals, this would shield wider assemblages of smaller animals, and efforts to target key habitat became tightly interwoven with the conception of parks as spaces set apart from human, permanent human occupation. And, th of course, this is uh, regularly called the Yellowstone model. Yellowstone Park model, or sometimes the U.S. Park model, part of the context for which was the near annihilation of the buffalo. <coughs> Celebrated by some as America's best idea and export, parks grew into the cornerstone 
of global conservation politics in the 20th century, even as conservation advocacy expanded to encompass a bro the broader crisis of biodiversity loss, and, became and it became increasingly clear that sustaining relatively healthy populations of large animals did not alone assure healthy ecosystem function. And still, large animals have remained central to target setting, protected areas management, broad ethical narratives, and, and tourism appeal. And I think that continuing emphasis is, is suggested by a quick glance at a lot of the iconography that surrounds parks the world over. And large protected areas are also central, or sorry, large um, expanding from protected areas into growing visions of conservation and corridors. Uh, animals are also very, large animals especially, are very central to the growing narratives of rewilding uh, and enhanced landscape connectivity. And I've just given one great example of the, arguably one of the biggest visions of rewilding and corridor building, uh, the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, um, set of protected areas which a, a narrative of a wide-ranging wolf featured uh, very prominently in that growth. But hopeful imaginaries of expanding corridors belie the state of park-centered conservation which is vexed by two essential problems. First, there is a clear recognition that the current state of global protected areas is much too small to arrest the threat of uh, to arrest the loss of biodiversity and that's very widely recognized in conservation biology. Second, a significant number of parks are extremely precarious, facing pressure from poaching, farming, ranching, and artisanal mining, amid serious shortfalls in staffing, monitoring, and enforcement, or where designations are compromised by later discoveries of subsurface resources. In short, many parks are suffering from a thousand small cuts, while a few get undermined with one swift blow, as we just saw in Utah. This precarity is concentrated in the tropics, where the IUCN states that very pre-protected areas are permanently secure in, in its terms. A growing part of the soaring scale of, uh, a growing part of the, the crisis of parks relates to the soaring scale of the global trade in endangered live animals and body parts, which is being met with increasingly militarized responses from armed rangers carrying semi-automatic weapons to high-tech surveillance, GIS, satellite data, drones, hidden cameras are all emerging elements of conservation practice today. Many recent campaigns exemplify the primacy of securing parks and stopping trade with the fate of many large endangered animals shown to hang in the balance of their intervention and of course of individual donations. While the fact that large corporate donors constitute the overwhelming source of, for global conservation organizations, that part obviously goes unsaid. This is one of my favorite images uh, from Conservation International. Uh, buy this acre, protect this acre. Um, such visions of conservation are at once both undeniable and profoundly limiting. Clearly, large animals have a crucial strategic and symbolic role in defining parks and protected areas and mobilizing popular and political support. It is also clear that the survival of many species now hinges on the defense of parks and on aggressive efforts to stop wildlife trade. Yet, as Brockington, uh, Duffy and Ego suggest, there is also a very big risk that the overwhelming focus on guarding relatively small pieces of land can restrict what they call conservation's theater of operations, how it's understood. In the, um, when the trajectories of animal life appear in a narrow profile, both crisis and responses seem to reside only in a distant nature somewhere out there, as if separate from the dynamics of everyday life, which only distant specialists and professionals can affect, or you can maybe affect through your donations. Another risk is that while endangered animals are undoubtedly the most enduring way to make the biodiversity, cross leg biodiversity crisis legible, they also risk obscuring some of its nature. As Rodolfo uh, Durzo and colleagues put it, extinction threats and events are only a small part of the actual loss of biodiversity. Drastic populations are occurring across a wide range of non-threatened vertebrates, and their data shows a mean decline of 25% in, in, in the number of individuals across a huge range of species over the past four decades. They use the term defaunation, which I think we'll be hearing more of in conservation biology, to denote the loss of both species and populations of wildlife, as well as the local declines in the abundance of individuals. And they also signal, they use this term to signal, how these losses then disrupt the healthy functioning of ecosystems. 
Now, there are immense complexities here uh, and some inevitable coarseness to these estimates, but multiple meta-surveys of wild animal populations in recent years have told very similar stories of precipitous declines. Furthermore, the losses are also evident moving down in body size from top predators and large herbivores to insects. Uh, and not only outside of parks, but increasingly inside of them too, which is another reason why the recent report on bug health in Germany is so disconcerting. The biannual living health index by the WWF is a, and the uh, Zoological Society of London is especially prominent in this, and I think it's notable that, they're start, that they have begun pursuing this, uh, this, this line beyond endangerment. Um, and 2016, their estimates appeared in a stream of eye-popping headlines based on an assessment of uh, 3,700 representative vertebrate species. As hard as it is to appreciate all of the dynamics, defaunation has, I think, tremendous potential to enlarge conceptions of the biodiversity crisis beyond extinctions and endangerment, though the term itself might be too sterile to resonate, and more intuitive language could help its essential message reach beyond the scientific literature. Conservation biologists have already provided some good possibilities, I think, with images of empty forests, um, though the problem goes beyond forests, and landscapes haunted by ghosts, the latter having been used to describe the extirpation of grizzly bears in the Pacific Northwest. This Grumbine book from the early 90s. And I believe the metaphor of ghosts works well to convey deep to convey defaunation for three main reasons. First, it expresses not only the precipitous decline of population, but it gives a heavy sense of devitalization. Not only are the dynamics of trophic webs being altered, but the spirit of landscapes is diminished in a way that is moving, yet also partly beyond human reckoning. Second, I think, it problematizes shifting baseline syndrome, challenging people to think about the ecological histories of areas that they might take for granted and question what they might have viewed as normal. Third, it pays homage to the legacy of peaceable resistance and hope reflected in the ghost dance, which emerged in the late 19th century following a tsunami of indigenous dispossession, ecological devastation, and the near extinction of the buffalo. When some indigenous groups in the US West began to dream about the resurgence of the buffalo across the plains. It arose slightly after the establishment of Yellowstone National Park, and it, and, it insists, and it insists that decolonization be part of expanded struggles for conservation. In the dream of the ghost dance, the dead were mourned, but there was much hope for renewal. But to imagine animal ghosts within impoverished landscapes is only part of the way towards appreciating the place of animals in the violent narrowing of life. The next step is to connect this to the vast populations of mammals and birds and fish um, that are intensively confined in production. Here, my premise is that if more people can begin to see and think about animals in the seemingly non-natural encounters every day, including how they are embedded in commodities, it can open up to a much wider sense of what needs to be acted on. My focus here is simultaneously concerned at global scale tendencies and patterns and at the scale of individual animal lives, especially in industrial design, meaning a combination of spatial configurations, key technological, including genetic innovations, and routinized practices. In my short time left, I will draw more from industrial livestock production, uh, which is the area I know best, uh, but similar compulsions and similar responses to the problems of scale prevail in intensive fur farms, aquaculture systems, and breeding sites geared to produce animals for vivisection, though the use values of animals bred for testing entails a particular kind of suffering. My previous book, The Ecological Hoofprint, focused on the exploding scale of industrial livestock production as a powerful force in global environmental degradation and inequality, and it set it in the context of the momentous increases in the consumption of animal flesh, what I call the meatification of diets. Meatification is encapsulated in the fact that the average person on Earth today eats nearly twice as much meat every year, over 43 kilograms, as only two generations ago when the average person in 1960 consumed about 23 kilograms. Amidst human population growth from 3 billion to 7.5 billion, now this story here conceals huge inequalities between rich and poor. I also stressed the, and that's something I unpack in a lot of detail in the book, 
Uh, I also stress the importance of seeing this growth in terms of an individual animal populations. In the early 1960s, there were set roughly 7 billion livestock animals on Earth at a given point in time, and roughly 8 billion killed every year for food. Today, the world livestock population is nearly four times that, uh, over 25 billion now, and eight times as many livestock are killed annually, now over 70 billion, which reflects the quickening turnover time from birth to slaughter. Poultry and pigs are at the forefront of growth in terms of the volume of production and in terms of individual animal lives, it overwhelmingly fixes on, po on poultry. Poultry and pigs together uh, comprise over 70% of animal flesh produced by volume every year. And, and their industrial production, poultry and pigs, is expected to drive virtually all future global increases if it does indeed materialize, which would mean a trajectory heading towards 120 billion animals killed for food every year by 2050. Again, versus 8 billion uh, killed in 1960. Three quick examples might help to put the growth of industrial livestock in the context of biodiversity. Researchers at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology recently estimated there are 1 billion less wild birds in North America than there were in 1970. Over the same period, there are a more than tripling of poultry populations in North America. All of these charismatic megafauna with estimate, estimated populations I've taken from the IUCN Red List could fit in to the single largest uh, industrial hog operation in the United States. A third way of thinking about uh, this growth, as stressed by Vaclav Smil, is that livestock constitute by far the largest part of terrestrial mammalian biomass. Though uh, this doesn't have the story of birds, which is a huge part of the story. And the pigs is sort of underrepresented here, because pigs are uh, brought from birth to slaughter in industrial systems in about six months. Uh, so they're turning over faster uh, chickens in about six weeks. To examine the implications of this, the environmental implications of this trajectory, the ecological hoofprint framework stresses um, that we need to think about industrial livestock production as both a spatially expansive enterprise commanding huge oceans of monocultures, close to one third of the world's arable land, and also a highly concentrated one with animals densely packed into islands. Both systems have achieved tremendous yield gains and output increases in output per farmer, but face a series of biological and physical barriers to scale that are never resolved but overridden instead with inputs like synthetic fertilizers, insecticides, herbicides, increased irrigation, and soaring levels of animal pharmaceuticals. This helps to open up a way of understanding the wide-ranging environmental burden of both systems, which are then magnified by the inefficiency at their nexus as the oceans of monocultures flow through the islands of animals. Large volumes of usable nutrition gets lost or burned, wasted in animals' metabolic processes. But the story of the ecological hoofprint was not only about additional land, water, and energy used in agriculture with rising production and consumption, or just the GH, story of GHG emissions, localized airborne pollutants, toxicity, excessive nutrient runoff, and risks of pest, weed, and pathogen resistance, and reducing antibiotic effectiveness over time. To analyze the barriers to scale in, in animal production and how they are overridden demands attention to the conditions of life for animals themselves. Themselves. And this is the central thread from the ecological hoofprint I'm pulling on and elaborating here, digging further into the design of breeding sites, factory farms, feedlots, transport systems, slaughterhouses, as well as aquaculture enclosures, fur farms, vivisection breeding, and um, the story of vivisection uh, involves a different life cycle story, as I indicated, so I'm focusing on the breeding side. In each of these systems, the conditions of animal life are primarily shaped by the twin goals of accelerating the turnover time and reducing the energy that animals waste on non-productive metabolic processes, or anything other than putting on mass, pumping out eggs and milk, or developing a big enough coat. For animals, this means confinement and density in a shared set of deprivations, movement, deprived of movement, sensory experiences, mental stimulation, familial bonds, maturation. Most are killed as juveniles. For producers, confinement and density pose a series of problems, some of which can be overridden by pharmaceuticals and pesticides, but some of which can't. With livestock, the pathological behaviors that stem from crowding, immobility, monotony, and stifled desires lead to 
uh, things like self-harm and aggression towards neighbors. And they're partly overridden through systemic physical mutilations, cutting off things like beaks, tails, needle teeth, testicles. The pressure to speed up both speed up and standardize reproduction of animals also relates to how animal bodies have been enhanced over time, which is increasingly also tied to the extreme specialization of breeding stock at separate sites, in many cases from, um, from which infants are purchased, as well as the design of patentable traits and the decline of genetic diversity. In fur, there's also a process of, of selecting for docility uh, in minks and even foxes. Um, acceleration and modification also hinges crucially on artificial insemination, which, as Karen Davis argued, is really better understood as the unremitting sexual assault of animals. And in industrial pig and chicken and turkey operations, animals can't even physically copulate anymore. They, ha they have to be uh, inseminated. Uh, although there are already considerable levels of automation in some of these systems, there are elements from insemination to killing to processing animals that require human dexterity and reactivity, uh, for the time being at least, at least until highly, evo uh, highly evolved AI is developed, that, uh, I, that is artificial intelligence that is both highly dexterous and quickly adaptive. Put simply, a large and growing share of animal life is being conceived and manipulated in utterly different ways than ever before, while at the same time vanishing from sight and mind. The degree to which animal lives are dominated in these systems, disregarded in consumption, and governed by markets, are the core elements of a process I call commodifonation, to describe instances where animal lives themselves are conceived as an almost pure commodity relation. Like defaunation, there is a possibility, though, that the message can get lost in a clunky term. And so I think it's better conveyed with a plainer description. A large and growing share of animal life is being reduced to little more than fungible things. To close, I thought it might be good to briefly move from this big picture down to the scale of the landscape, the very ordinary <laughs> landscape that I come from in, in southern Ontario. I was born and raised in Waterloo and live an hour away in London, which are located in the traditional territories of the Attawadurandan, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Lene Nunuape peoples. And they are part of the Carolinian bioregion, one of the most threatened ecoregions in Canada, with the highest proportion of listed endangered species in Canada, and a, and a landscape that was once home to cougars, wolves, and black bears, among many other large mammals. The landscape must have been beautiful, and it still is in tiny patches, which conservationists are working tirelessly to restore and, if possible, connect. But much of this landscape is now sprawling cities and towns, highways, strip malls, and most of all, oceans of corn, soy, canola, and wheat monocultures, and islands filled with millions upon millions of animals who most people never see. Never will you see a pig or a chicken in these landscapes, and increasingly you won't even see cattle, which are becoming rapidly industrialized. Um, and most people, the only way they'll see these animals is in the back of trucks. Uh, at least see them alive, I mean. Animals have always had a central place in, in the science and politics of conservation and how problems are understood and, how, and animals can have a significant bearing how they're understood, how the crisis, these trajectories of animal life are understood or not uh, seen has a big bearing, I think, on what counts as conservation and what doesn't, what is seen to be contestable and what isn't. In this project, I attempt to draw attention to these two momentous yet widely invisible trajectories of animal life, defaunation and commodifaunation, and suggest that ghosts and things might mark these dynamics in a sort of indelible way that keeps them held in uh, indivisible relation to one another. The image of landscapes haunted by animal ghosts stresses that the narrowing of animal life extends far beyond extinction and endangerment, and also involves the widespread population declines that are occurring among many non-threatened species. The image of growing populations of animals conceived mostly as things aims to draw attention to the vast worlds of domination and anguish that are concealed in landscapes, and which are ultimately concealed in innumerable commodities. Put side by side, the violent narrowing of animal life comes into focus as something that is both sprawling and also incredibly ferociously intimate. This lens is also meant as a provocation to challenge people to think about their relations and responsibilities to other species in a fast-changing world, how every human bears directly on many animal lives that they never see, and how the rising scale of animal production and consumption relates to a pathological way of organizing nature. Something which, 
I should say, recent Rachel Carson understood very well, having written the preface to the first book that shed light on the then rising story of industrial livestock. I'll leave it there. <laughs>